Hello, everyone. It is 7 o'clock here in the UK. You are very welcome to spend your breakfast with us wherever you're watching us this morning. We're expecting a major announcement from Nissan very shortly, which will allow its Sunderland plant to increase production of electric vehicles. We'll be live there to speak to the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng. Plus, arms at the ready with a third of us set to get a third COVID jab alongside the winter flu vaccine. Also this morning for you, one of the biggest live shows on earth is back. We'll hear about the return of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And it's definitely not a bird or a plane. We'll speak to one of the designers of a flying car which has just completed its maiden flight. Let's hope they're not winging it. It's Thursday, the 1st of July, pinch a punch. A clean set of wheels, Nissan is expected to announce plans for a giant factory to build batteries for electric vehicles and create thousands of new jobs. The crumbling city, a warning for the world about the effects of climate change on the Bangladeshi capital, Dhaka. People who don't believe that climate change is happening are totally ignorant. Closing the gap, the clothing retailer abandons its high street stores in the UK and moves online. Conviction overturned. Criticism as the actor Bill Cosby maintains his innocence on his release from jail. Brothers reunited, princes William and Harry will come together to unveil a statue of their mother on what would have been her 60th birthday later on today. And we start off July with the same weather that we ended June on. Will it brighten up and become drier into the weekend? I'll have the details for you later. Morning, everybody. Within the next half an hour, we're expecting the Japanese car giant Nissan to unveil plans to build a huge battery factory to boost production of electric vehicles and create 2,000 jobs at its Sunderland plant. Our business correspondent, Paul Kelso, is there for us. Hello to you, Paul. So tell us more about this project. Yeah, good morning, Kay. Um, we are expecting some good news, certainly for uh, the future of the Sunderland Nissan factory where I am this morning. We don't have the details yet. We'll be getting them in about 20 minutes' time. But the expectation is a major new facility uh, adjacent to this site to build batteries that will power the next generation of electric vehicles. We know the government has said by 2030 that petrol and diesel engine cars, new petrol and diesel engine cars, uh, will be banned. So there there is a pressure to move to electric cars and this investment, the scale of which we don't uh, yet know, but expected to be certainly the largest planned battery factory, so-called gigafactories in the phrase used uh, coined by Elon Musk, uh, will be built here. They already build an electric vehicle here, the Nissan Leaf, certainly the short range version of that, uh, the first all electric uh, mass production car, Nissan call it. They already make that here and there's a battery plant adjacent to this site which produces those, but this will be a much bigger investment and it will not only secure the jobs that are already here at this plant but should create new jobs and perhaps signal the start of the move towards mass production of electric cars that's so vital uh, to hitting net zero targets and you can expect ministers all the way to the top to be all over this announcement it's good news for the northeast and it will be hailed as good news for the uk okay no, thank you thanks so much uh, and I'm going to be uh, chatting uh, very shortly indeed to the minister involved. We'll hear from the Nissan bosses as well at a news conference in Sunderland. As I said, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng speaking to us at 7.20. Half the population could be offered a COVID booster this winter. The NHS is preparing to administer extra shots alongside its regular flu vaccine programme. What is that going to look like? Let's speak to visiting professor of microbiology at the University of Oxford and advisor to the government's vaccine task force, and that's Geoffrey Armand. Hello to you. Thank you for joining us, Professor, this morning. Let me just ask you, first of all, more and more people, um, it would appear, who have been double jabbed are contracting COVID. What difference will a booster make? Well, it will only help. And uh, there, are, there are quite a number of vaccines that we give as three doses. Most of the childhood vaccines we give as three doses. It gives a, a boost to the immune system, uh, raises the levels of antibodies and makes that protection even more secure. So in principle, it's a good idea. 
Of course, there are issues around supply, who gets it, and uh, also questions about, about availability of vaccine into the winter, given that the world is still crying out for it. Um, so this is an ambitious program, in principle excellent, but practically um, perhaps a bit more of a challenge. OK, and how, how are you feeling about mixing and matching vaccines? No problem at all. Uh, we have a lot of vaccines uh, currently that we take that mixes that are mixes and matches. In childhood, we typically give diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis together. Sometimes we add polio and uh, haemophilus uh, to that. So combination vaccines are have been with us for a long, long time. Of course, you try. Uh, you need to do trials to make sure that when you do mix. Um, you, you know, you get the appropriate responses. Uh, mixing across companies, so if you've had Pfizer and then you go to AstraZeneca or, or vice versa, again, not a problem. You're going to provoke an immune response that will be a boost. These vaccines are similar enough to be able to reinforce each other. Uh, so I have no, no problems at all with that. In fact, there may even be some advantages to that. And how are you feeling about kids being vaccinated? Well, you know, we keep hearing from ministers, don't we, about, you know, 70, 80 percent of the adult population is being in, uh, as being jabbed. Uh, that's good. But the real figure that's important is what proportion of the whole population. At the start of this, we reckon that you needed somewhere around 65, 70 percent of the population, the whole population, to be immune in order to have that herd immunity, which prevents the virus spreading. Now, since then, we've got these rather more transmissible variants, particularly the Delta. So maybe that figure has gone up to around 70% because it has a, 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 a bigger R number, R zero number. Um, and, you know, therefore, we have to think about vaccinating the kids um, because 80% of the adult population, if that only represents 50% of the whole population, we're still too low to prevent the virus spreading and it will spread in kids. So uh, I, I'm in favour, if we can and when we can, of, uh, of vaccinating children as well so that the whole population is immune to the point where the virus can no longer circulate. And how are you feeling, Professor, about um, suggestions after the 19th of July, Terminus Day, as it's uh, been called, that we're just going to have to live with COVID and it's just going to be part of our society like pneumonia or the flu? Well, that's probably the reality. Um, again, if we can get the herd immunity up by vaccination to very high levels, then any outbreaks might be quite localised and won't spread across the country. Um, and I think, yeah, clearly um, COVID will be with us for quite a long time. And we've got to get used to it. We do have outbreaks, of course, of other virus infections in the winter, um, flu notably, but also what we call rhinoviruses, common cold, respiratory syncytial virus. They come round every winter and perhaps, perhaps uh, COVID will be the same. Uh, it, it's worth observing, however, that the serious pandemics of the 20th century, 1918, 57, 68, etc., uh, which were, in fact, all flu, in the first wave, the first year, those viruses, those pandemics were quite severe with a lot of deaths. As they went on, although those same viruses with changes continued to circulate, they became attenuated. They were less uh, virulent in the population and cause less deaths. And it may be that when we're vaccinated and we've seen COVID before, if we do get infected in the future, it may well be that it's significantly more mild than it has been on this first wave of infections in the human population. Okay, fascinating stuff, Professor. Thanks for taking the time to join us this morning. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, the Bangladeshi capital of Dhaka is said to be crumbling Officials there are warning it could become a security problem for the whole world, with the risk of tens of millions of so-called climate migrants. Bangladesh, with a population of more than 163 million people, is facing a climate emergency. Last year alone saw more than 4 million people displaced, caused by intense flooding, which continues to devastate villages and farmland, worsening an already dire situation of rural poverty in the country. 
During monsoon season, at least a quarter of Bangladesh found itself submerged. It's a problem that's growing at an alarming rate. By 2050, it's estimated sea levels could rise by half a metre. Washing away 11% of the country's land, with homes, schools and in some cases entire villages fading away due to land erosion. Many find they have no other choice but to migrate to Dhaka. They join up to 2,000 people who make the journey into the capital every day, searching for better living conditions and new opportunities. But it's a city already struggling to cope, with a growing population of nearly 22 million. Bangladesh's government has told Sky News that climate migration could create a global refugee crisis. In the first in a series of special reports from Bangladesh, Katerina Vitozzi has been to Dhaka, where climate displaced people are now trapped in slums in a cycle of debt and poverty. In Kalyanpur slum, there are no road names, just alleyway numbers. It's dark, dirty, and a side of climate change you don't expect and rarely see. Every year, climate change is forcing half a million Bangladeshis from their rural homes. Most end up in Dakar's city slums, where space is running out. Salam alaikum, Nur Jahan. <laughs> Nur Jahan Begum arrived last year from the coast with her family. She tells us they had a small farm, but now they're renting a two room shack with no windows and barely enough room to move. I'm going to to I'm Bangladesh is on the climate change front line. It's geographically vulnerable to rising sea levels and stronger cyclones. Most climate migrants were fishermen or farmers. They've seen their homes, livelihoods, even their land disappear. Until then, they're stuck in a place where landlords, some with political connections, charge high prices for unsafe homes. Electricity is connected illegally. Sewers flood when it rains. <laughs> But what use is a dustpan against monsoon rain? And a drain put in to help does the reverse. That brings the water, but that's bringing the water in. You want the water to go the other way. Yes, and the water is dirty, he says. It smells. Dhaka is now the most crowded city in the world. <laughs> On the verge of yet another strict COVID-19 lockdown, thousands of migrant workers have escaped for their rural homes. Climate change migrants don't have that option. <laughs> Over the last 20 years, Bangladesh has lifted millions of people out of poverty. At the capital's main port, you can see the trade and industry that has expanded the economy, grown the middle class, but also drawn people to a city that now can't cope. 
Dhaka is crumbling. Dhaka is crumbling under, under people coming here. And do you think this is the side of climate change that people just don't see and don't realise exists? Yeah, they don't connect uh, this reality with climate change because, because they think it's coastal areas, this is, uh, this is something that's going to happen in the future. But this is dystopia. I mean, this is happening in real time. And I think the world doesn't know enough about it. But people here can't just wait. She understands English. Are you understanding this? She read in class. In one alleyway, we meet Tanya Akhtar, who's 18. H-S-T. Her family moved here to escape rising sea levels. She hopes this small school run on the family bed can somehow do something. I teach them English, Bengali, math. They are, they doesn't speak English. I am little, I'm little, but I try my best to teach them. This is Minara, this is Tanya's mother, and she wanted to tell us how proud she felt of her daughter for doing this teaching, but she wanted to try and say it in English. So Tanya is doing a little bit of impromptu teaching as well, so that she can say it on camera of how proud she is of her daughter. Do you want to, do you want to say it now, Minara? Minara, volo. Yes, I'm Minara. Minara. How, tell us how you feel about your daughter. I feel proud. I feel proud. proud. Proud to my daughter. To my daughter. <laughs> in climate change, there are tipping points, a moment from where there is no return. People here want to go back home, but to what? For many, this is now their future. Katarina Vitozzi, Sky News, Dakar. And a reminder, you can watch The Daily Climate Show on Sky News every weekday at 6.30 and 9.30. Still to come on the programme for you, we're going to be talking to royal historian Robert Lacey as Princes William and Harry prepare to unveil a statue marking what would have been their mother's 60th birthday today. That's at half past seven. The government will reduce furlough and business rates relief from today. Labour says more than 400,000 businesses will be affected. Bridget Phillipson, the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, joins us at five past eight. And then at half past eight, we'll speak to Labour MP Stella Creasy on why she is challenging the parliamentary authorities about her maternity leave. Fashion retailer Gap has announced it's to close all of its shops in Britain and move completely online. Uh, Shaman Freeman Powell is at one of its stores in Oxford Street here in London for us this morning. Hello to you, Shaman. This must mean a lot of jobs at risk. Yes, it does. As we know, it's going to be a huge loss to the high street. Uh, Gap is an American company, but it's been in the UK since 1987. And this morning, it announced that it will be closing all 81 of its stores in a move to take its business online. Now, 81 stores may not sound like a lot, but it does have a huge presence on the high street. And if you think about the local Gap in your local area, they usually are quite big shops, so it will really hit work is hard. Um they are saying that it's been a part of a review where it was reviewing all of its European stores. It's not clear what's going to be happening to them, but we do know that here in the UK, they will be closing in what Gap are describing as a phased manner from the end of August until the end of September. So it doesn't give them very long at all. The union leader, Paddy Lidis, he's a union leader for shop workers. He's described it as a devastating move. And he also referenced the closures of Arcadia and Debenham and said that as far as he concerned, it proves that there needs to be government intervention and that the government needs to speak to unions and workers to try and come up with a plan of getting more sort of online taxes so that they can save the high street. OK, thank you. Also making news for you this morning on the programme, large-scale celebrations have been taking place to mark the 100th birthday of the ruling Chinese Communist Party. Leaders attended a parade in Beijing where the president vowed that China would complete reunification with Taiwan. Donald Trump's company and its finance chiefs have been indicted on tax-related crimes. It follows an investigation by officials in New York into how the Trump organisation gave non-monetary benefits such as apartments and cars to top executives. Mr Trump has said such dealings are standard practice. 
And the former United States Defence Secretary Donald Rumsfeld has died at the age of 88. The former President George Bush described him as a man who never paled before tough decisions. He became famous for his quotes, such as this one during a press conference in Washington. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. But, excuse me, but is this an unknown unknown? Uh, just, I'm not. Several unknowns, and I'm, I'm just wondering I'm not if this going, is an unknown I'm not going to say which it is. <laughs> OK. Uh, we're telling you at the top of the hour, whether the car giant Nissan is uh, announcing a so-called gigafactory at its plant in Sunderland to produce batteries to power electric vehicles. Well, let's speak to the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, who is at the Nissan plant in Sunderland this morning. Good morning to you. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. Um, is Nissan a good candidate for uh, state aid now, or have you helped them enough already? I think Nissan's investment UK in here in Sunderland is a really, really good news story. Uh, I've been conversing uh, with Nissan executives, also with Envision, uh, who are making uh, the battery, the, the gigafactory that you described. And this is a really positive story for the UK. We're delighted that they're, they're going to be creating uh, 1,600 new jobs between them. These are very well-paid jobs, and I think it's an excellent uh, development for here in the North East and also for the UK. Will we give them more money if they need it via state aid? We are in conversation with them, as with other companies, uh, and they feel that this is exactly the right place uh, to invest in. We're very, very keen to develop that relationship, and it's a very good one for the UK and also for people here in the North East. So if they did come to the government and say, look, we need a bit more money in order to develop this further for the future, then they, they would be pushing at an open door? I wouldn't say that they're pushing at an open door. We always look uh, to get a, a good uh, investment in terms of taxpayers' money. But they have a very good relationship with us. Uh, they've been here since 1986, uh, and they want to commit to this plant for decades to come. OK, why electric cars over synthetic fuel? I think electric cars uh, have proven uh, their green credentials. Uh, they're popular. People are buying them in increasing numbers. And it's really the way of the future. And that's why uh, Nissan are investing uh, so heavily here in the Northeast. And that's why that many countries, uh, competitive, advanced economies, are seeking to attract this kind of investment to build gigafactories uh, so that they can build electric vehicles. These are the, the, the transport of the future. You're not, you're not dismissing synthetic fuel, though, are you? Dismissing uh, any uh, decarbonised source of fuel. In fact, the synthetic uh, aviation uh, fuel, synthetic aviation fuel, is something that we're very keen to promote uh, here in the UK. Okay. Uh, and we're looking at all sorts of... Uh, technologies to drive uh, lo very low carbon uh, transport. OK, we've only got five minutes, so we'll counter through another couple of points, if we may. This NHS app, we were told it was perfect to uh, confirm double vaccinations for people who wanted to go on overseas holidays. I'm sure you saw what happened with people who were trying to go to Malta yesterday. They were told that the app is just not good enough and they had to leave the airport and go home. What on earth is going on? What are we going to do about that? Well, we're trying to engage, uh, as you know, with uh, countries across the EU. Uh, we feel that uh, the double vaccination does provide really, really first-class uh, support and, and protection against uh, the variants. Uh, all the evidence suggests that. Uh, and we need to speak to EU governments and other countries uh, to make that case. I, I don't know what happened. Uh, well, I do know what happened in Malta, but I don't know what the process was uh, for the Maltese government to get to reach that decision. Uh, but it's something that we clearly have to engage uh, with other governments uh, across the EU and, uh, and across the world. But uh, people, to going, sure to that, uh, show people going to... Sorry to interrupt you. I know we're on speaker, which makes it slightly difficult, and we're also pushed for time. But people who are going on holiday today, uh, they should still be confident that if they've got their two vaccinations on their NHS app, that should be good enough to fly to their chosen holiday destination. 
Obviously, it should be, but I can't guarantee what other uh, governments are going to do, um, like the Maltese government. But I, 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 if I were uh, a traveller, I'd be very confident that I'd be able to go to my destination without uh, any hindrance. When can parents be confident that their children can be vaccinated against COVID-19? Will it be now or will we have to wait until September? Well, the, um, the, the JCVI have made very clear uh, that they haven't uh, actually given the clearance for children uh, to be vaccinated. We've successfully vaccinated something like uh, 45 million first doses uh, for over 18s, uh, but we're still waiting for uh, confirmation that we can vaccinate children. And until uh, that happens, uh, we, we're not going to vaccinate children. OK, and a final thought before I let you go. 400 Scottish fans at Wembley, when they came down for the game against England, have now tested positive. Uh, what impact is that going to have on the scheme that the government is presently uh, running? And, and specifically, the Euro 2020 final at Wembley. As far as the government is concerned, that will still go ahead, despite the fact that there's this massive outbreak. Absolutely. But the key to the outbreak, the key to dealing with the coronavirus is the vaccination. So I'd urge anyone who hasn't been vaccinated to get uh, their first dose, anyone over 18. And people should be encouraged to get the second dose. That's what's giving us uh, the protection that we need to fight this terrible uh, virus. Come the 19th of July, are you going to ditch your mask? <laughs> I'm going to see what the guidance says. I mean, clearly, uh, people find, uh, many people find uh, the mask sometimes uh, difficult to wear, but it is the guidance. I think we should follow the guidance to keep ourselves safe and, more importantly, to keep others uh, safe uh, as well, more vulnerable people. OK. I know that you have to flee, so I must let you go. It's good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us from Sunderland this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Now, there's a new top dog in number 11 Downing Street this morning alongside the Chancellor. Uh, Rishi Sunak has revealed on Twitter that he has a new pet. He simply wrote, meet Nova. It's a thought Nova is a golden Labrador. I'm not sure she is. Uh, just, uh, too soon to say if he'll get on with Larry the office cat next door. Do you remember? We'll try and find the quote for you. He was on the programme at the end of last year saying that he was going to give in and let the kids have a dog. And there you are. There he is. I think he's... Is he? I'm not sure he's a golden lab. You probably know better. Let me know. Quick look at the weather for you now. Here's Naz. Morning, Naz. Naz. Good morning. You would definitely know, uh, Kay, but uh, I definitely don't know. Whatever it is, it's definitely cute. <laughs> Uh, looking kind of cute for the weather today as well. Not for everywhere, though. Some areas are going to be rather cloudy and cool again. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Good morning. So for the first day of July, we are going to see similar conditions as the last day of June. Once again, most places will be fine, dry and warm with some good spells of sunshine developing this afternoon, but not everywhere. It's the east once again that will be plagued with cloudy skies and light rain and drizzle. It's quite a murky start out there this morning as well, with uh, also some patches of mist and fog, but mainly dry. Brightening up into this afternoon quite quickly, and in the sunshine it will feel warm, but some showers are likely across southern parts of England and Wales and for the southeast of Ireland. Some of them could be quite heavy, particularly around the Dorset and Hampshire area, and it stays cloudy and cool around eastern parts. Of England. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Princess William and Harry will unveil a statue of their mother on what would have been her 60th birthday today. Royal historian Robert Lacey joins us next.
It is an absolute carnival kind of atmosphere out here for Prime Minister Modi's decisive victory. These students are defying the prohibitory orders and now they're going to be arrested. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. The roads have been inundated. The only way out is to get people by boat. What is feared that over 200 people might have died because of these landslides. This on any given day would have been bustling with people, but today it's absolutely deserted. This is one of the most sensitive areas of, uh, of Northeast Delhi where there's been clashes. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Hello, my name is Nadja Frontier. My name is Brian Matthews. I'm the marine assistant at Rothera Research Station. Which is to the west of the West Antarctic Peninsula. So far I've been here for five months and it is an absolutely wonderful experience. My name is Fatma Zilzila, the founder of ICASA from Kuwait, where we face many environmental problems related to waste pollution, deforestation and lack of information. We are collecting recyclables from houses, schools and businesses in order to recycle them. In exchange of your recyclables, you get a tree. Hello again everybody, the car firm Nissan has announced it will build a factory to make batteries for electric vehicles in Sunderland. The company claims the so-called Gigafactory will eventually create more than 6,000 jobs. A short time ago, the business minister, Kwasi Kwarteng, told the programme the scheme would provide a major economic boost. Electric cars uh, have proven uh, their green credentials. Uh, they're popular, people are buying them in increasing numbers. And it's really the way of the future, and that's why uh, Nissan are investing uh, so heavily here in the Northeast. And that's why that many countries, uh, competitive, advanced economies, are seeking to attract this kind of investment to build gigafactories uh, so that they can build electric vehicles. These are the, the, the transport of the future. Tomorrow's here, but will they get state aid? Well, Kay, I think the question is how much have they had already because yeah. Nissan are putting a billion pounds into building this factory, be up and running by 2024, supplying batteries for 100,000 electric cars a year. So a big expansion of what they're doing already in Sunderland, as the government say, good news, post-Brexit jobs uh, and so on. Have the government put in some of that money? Kwasi Kwarteng was a little bit tight-lipped when you asked him, will they be eligible for the new state aid regime going forward? He said they wouldn't be pushing it an open door. So trying not to sound as if they're favouring uh, Nissan, but that will be uh, the question, I think, asked about how much uh, money they will get or have had already uh, from government. But uh, one of the biggest investments in the North East since the 1980s, uh, so good news there. And Britain catching up with uh, rivals in France and Germany on electric cars, because don't forget, new petrol and diesel cars will be banned. You won't be able to buy one after 2030. So uh, the investment in electric cars really does need to scale up. Yes, synthetic fuel, though, important mm -hmm, as absolutely. well. I'm sure we can develop that argument uh, as the weeks and months progress. Just a quick thought on the app, though. I mean, he wasn't very helpful on whether people turning up at the airport today can just use their app to show that they've been double vaccinated in order to travel overseas on holiday. No, the problem these holiday makers have had it in Malta, booking those holidays in good faith after it went on the green list, is they took their NHS app and were told you need to have a printed out letter which from the NHS. Which takes five days to get. Which takes five days to get, so their holiday days have been ruined and mm -hmm. if different countries are going to impose uh, different restrictions that really does change things regarding the green list. Yeah.
branch shop said, I'll really need to get their act together on that, especially if people are hoping to travel for the first time in maybe 18 months or whatever, and they don't know whether they get to the airport, whether they'll be able to go. Absolutely, holidays. Kids, suitcases, them. aggravation from everybody, nightmare for now. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Quick look at the front pages for you uh, this morning. This is what it's looking like. The Times says half the population will be offered a third coronavirus jab alongside the winter flu vaccine from September. The Mail also leads on that booster programme, which will be offered to the over 50s. The Telegraph says that Downing Street has told head teachers to stop sending whole school bubbles home to self-isolate when just one pupil tests positive for COVID. And The Guardian questions the safety of hosting the final stages of Euro 2020 at Wembley after hundreds of Scottish fans who travelled to London for the match against England tested positive for COVID. The minister said that it would still go ahead. Uh, the Mirror reports Princes William and Harry are putting aside their differences to unveil a statue of their mother, Princess Diana. Well, the royal historian Robert Lacey is joining us now. Hello to you, Mr Lacey. Thanks for joining us on the programme this morning. The boys are going to be together later on. What's that going to be like? <sighs> They're going to be just over there. Um, I can tell you that. What's that going to be like? Um, uh, Obviously, they're here to, to pay tribute to their mother, and that will presumably be, re be reflected in, in, in what they say. They're going to make separate speeches. Um, this will all be under the auspices of their Uncle Charles Spencer with their, their two aunts. Um, it will be very much a Spencer occasion, even if we were not so focused on the two of them. I think this opening of the statue here to Diana. It's not the first monument uh, in Kensington to, to her. There's a, there's a, there's a playground, a, a walkway, a fountain. This was planned by the brothers as the, the ultimate tribute. Um, members of the public, I think, from tomorrow will be able to walk around there and look at it through the hedge. And then if you pay some extra, you can actually go into the palace and see it. Um, it's going to be a short ceremony. Two o'clock this afternoon, um, only half an hour allowed, a couple of cameras. They want to keep it private. Uh, indeed. So it, we know that it's been a very strained uh, relationship between the two brothers since that Oprah interview. Some suggestions in the papers that that has uh, warmed up somewhat uh, when the boys were chatting about football over the last couple of days. What's your understanding of what's going on? Well, the, the breakdown in the relationship went way beyond um, back before the, 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 the Oprah um, interview. That, of course, has made things worse because of what Harry said, an almost calculated attack on his father, Prince Charles, and the parenting he so resented, he said. Um, the other insidious thing about the Oprah interview was that, um, uh, and what in, in, in the days that followed, was the way in which private conversations between Harry and the family got repeated on American television. Now, that rather undermines negotiations or talks um, coming back together. If, if William, on his side, feels that anything he says is going to find its way uh, into, the, into the media, then how is he going to have a, a, a serious conversation about patching things up? What role, if any, is their father going to play today? No role for Prince Charles, no role for the Queen. Um, this does mark, um, as I was saying, a, a big stage in the spensification, if you like, of the royal family. Some people would say what we're looking at is a row between a red-headed Spencer and his equally hot-headed brother. And so it's appropriate, really, that Uncle Charles and the two aunts will be here and... Um, well, one runs out of clichés, oil on troubled waters, some sort of gesture towards each other. Um, people say, well, um, what would happen if Diana were present today? Well, she will be present this afternoon physically. We'll see what this statue looks like. Um, and, of course, she will be in the minds and hearts of those two young men. And presumably that will influence their behaviour towards each other. They'll be conscious that although there are only a few cameras there, the eyes of the world will be upon them, and by this evening, we'll know more. Um, um, Robert, a quick thought about uh, the statue. One wonders how it will uh, stand the test of time, I, I think particularly of not too far away from where you're standing at the moment and the Diana Water Memorial. I mean, that's been a bit of a white elephant, hasn't it? 
yes. Um, we've got right here um, um, a statue of Queen Victoria as well. Um, statues are rather um, out of fashion at the moment, um, but uh, the brothers thought that's what they wanted to do for um, years ago. What's interesting is apparently she's not just standing there. She's doing something that symbolizes what she, Diana, stood for. Whether there's another figure, a child she's reaching out to, we don't know. So that will be very interesting this afternoon, um, along with the way the two brothers react not just to the statue, which they've chosen themselves, um, but to each other. OK. Uh, Robert, 2 o'clock this afternoon, we'll know more. For now, thank you for your expertise. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 2 o'clock this afternoon is when the statue will be unveiled. Both boys will be at that uh, opening, unveiling uh, ceremony. Of course, we'll cover it for you here on Sky News. Meantime, police have been heavily criticised for their handling of two high-profile public protests. One involved a demonstration against the government's new crime bill in Bristol earlier this year. Uh, let's speak to the Police and Crime Commissioner for Avon and Somerset Police, and that is Mark Shelford. Mr Shelford, thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. Pretty damning report, isn't it, for your police service? Uh, I think it's entirely he uh, healthy that uh, the police should uh, face... Uh, scrutiny and accountability of what they did. But the um, particular riot was uh, a, a unique situation and very difficult for the police, particularly under the COVID-19 legislation, um, to not, and, it, and it did not allow the public to protest at the time. The forces, in the quotes from the, um, the report, failed to understand their legal duties, police officers failing to understand their legal duties in respect of the protest and failed to conduct a proper assessment of the proportionality of their actions. It's very difficult for the police on the front line uh, to be asked to make those sort of uh, legal uh, judgments. And this is an element that I think is very important for government and uh, our, our lawmakers, our MPs, to understand when they produce a law, how it will then be uh, enacted in, on the front line. And they always need to think that. And that's something I've been uh, talking to our MPs uh, about, to make sure that it minimises that amount of element on the front line where police have to interpret the law. So it's very clear. The police should know the law and know when they've gone too far, surely? Um, absolutely. And I, and I think that the use of force was entirely proportionate uh, at the time when it went from a peaceful protest to an extremely violent, one of the most violent protests we've seen in this country uh, for a long time. And people who peacefully protest don't come to uh, protests with fireworks in their pockets to throw out police forces. I mean, it, it was uh, outrageous. Now, um, I think it's terribly important that we are allowed to peacefully protest. That's our democratic right. It's enshrined in law. But as soon as it, it tips over into violence and disorder and assault, um, then the police need to make sure they, they uh, understand the public safety issues, and the police must absolutely deal with that robustly, as they did, but with proportionate use of force uh, when it was necessary. So you completely disagree with the report when it says that the police went too far? Yes. Um, why? Because I think it's, uh, it was a proportionate use of force to extremely violent protesters. Uh, uh, when it when it turned into a public order situation. So uh, I think that the, the police were absolutely right. But part of my role is to scrutinise and hold the police accountable and make sure that the chief constable has explained absolutely the strategy around what they were trying to do at the time and that if there were any complaints about e excessive force, those were uh, uh, and must be thoroughly investigated by the police standards uh, uh, authority, which they were, uh, and also sent to any complaints were sent to the uh, independent office of uh, police conduct, uh, and those have all come back uh, saying that the police were uh, correct and 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 they did use proportionate force uh, for that violent protest. But how much damage then can this report uh, findings do to, for as, as far as the trust? in the police service in Avon and Somerset 
is concerned. How can you start to mend bridges? Because they fundamentally disagree with your point of view or the, the way of looking at it is you fundamentally disagree with them. Well, I think there are two things there. There's, there's the strategic issue around government and the laws, which we, we talked about earlier on, and making sure those laws are correct. And there's no, none of this, in, in the report, it talked about one law trumping another. That's incredibly difficult for frontline officers to, to understand. And I've been on the front line in a previous existence. So I know how difficult it is when you're in a riot to try and interpret those laws. That's the first thing. Uh, and so we may, must make sure that our lawmakers get it right. But the second aspect is, is locally, and I'm new in post um, after the, uh, this incident, as you know. Um, I've been in for about six weeks. Uh, and it's my job to go around to the communities, which I am doing now, to listen to them, to understand what their concerns are in the, in the broadest possible terms, and then to work with them uh, to rebuild that trust uh, and make sure that we bring in the police at the right time with the right people uh, in the neighbourhood groups, which are so vital, the PCSOs, to build that local relationship with uh, people and understand where there are issues and how we can try and solve them. OK, good to talk to you. Thanks for taking the time this morning. Appreciate it. My pleasure. And Thank a pleasure you. to be with you. Thank you. Uh, Award-winning chef Paul Ivich will speak at a global climate change summit to explain how your diet could improve the environment. He joins us next. Well, look, we know we've got to get rid of coal. Uh, you know, the world agrees that coal is the most polluting fossil fuel. Uh, we, The UK has done great things and more, more announcements today on its coal phase-out acceleration. But the UK is a tiny amount of global emissions with practically no coal left in its generation. And while we shut down coal, and other European countries do, countries like China are opening five times as much new coal as the rest of the world put together. And we know that many economies around the world world are still very, very coal dependent. So I co-created the PPCA, the Powering Pass Coal Alliance, with my good friend in Canada back in 2017. It's been a really effective way of getting governments to pledge to come off coal by 2030. Um, but the challenge is how do you get into these giant coal using countries? And at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, our members are drawn from the most ambitious global companies who have enormous supply chains that go right back into those factories that are burning coal across the world. And so we'll be working with our members as part of the PPCA to see how we can use the power of those supply chains, the power of those contracts to get this coal switch happening faster. Companies uh, like Apple, like Google, are very good actually at working with the local authorities to build renewable energy plants, for example, to work out how to make these changes on the ground. But we haven't been clear, in our view, enough about coal. We've, we've focused a lot on the switch to renewables. Then you often get into a row about, is it OK to use gas as a transitional fuel in the mix? You know, I'm sure you know this, but the way we got off coal in the UK, which happened very rapidly, is by standing up gas, standing up biomass and investing increasingly in renewables. But many countries say, well, we can't go straight to a renewable system. You can't, as an energy minister, I can tell you, you can't run a grid of 100% renewables. So we don't, we want to use gas and you're telling us we can't. So I think sharpening this message to say, yes, we want to transition to a renewables future, but in the meantime, let's put coal firmly in the gun sites and get rid of that in short order. You know, we, we look at the carbon dioxide levels, they're the highest they've been for four and a half million years. We need to make coal history and we need to do it now. Saya menggarap lahan hutan. Did you know symptoms of hay fever can develop at any stage of life, not just in childhood? The Pollen Reports, sponsored by Philips Connected Air Purifiers. 
It will be sunny for the majority of the UK and Ireland again today, except across eastern England, where it will stay predominantly cloudy and for coastal areas of the south and west. There may be a few showers over parts of Wales, the south of England and southwest Scotland, as well as across the cloudy east. Otherwise, it will be mainly dry and warm. Pollen levels will be high or very high for most places today, as we are now in the peak of the grass pollen season. Moderate levels are likely for the eastern side of Scotland, though. Fungal spores are also at a medium risk, and there is lots of weed pollen about, too. The Pollen Reports, sponsored by Philips Connected Air Purifiers. The film star turned environmental campaigner Arnold Schwarzenegger is inviting activists and inventors to a global summit to discuss ways of reducing the impact of climate change. Well, amongst those taking part is Chef Paul Ivich, who is uh, one of a handful of chefs to have won a Michelin star for vegetarian cooking. And he is with us now, as you can see. Good morning to you. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. Um, tell me about this summit and what you're doing there. Good morning, Kay. Uh, today I joined the World, Austrian World Summit. It's a great event and I talk with other peoples about the environment and what we can do. Why is it so close to your heart? Uh, I'm a chef and so it's very important for me because when, cook, when cooking, it's not whether we prepare fish, meat or vegetable. It's all about the ingredients that matter. It's about uh, respectful cooperation with the nature, with the animals and the people. When we see food holistically, we can change a lot. Our eating habits affects the environment, the economy, our social lives and our health and so it's my desire with my cuisine to connect to people again with the nature. How difficult is it or how difficult was it to get a Michelin star for being a vegetarian chef because you don't normally associate the two together do you? Yeah it's, it's like when you learn a new language it's quite hard but if you have a good passion and a good team, so you can achieve a lot. Do you know much about Arnold Schwarzenegger? Do you, have you met him before? What are you expecting from the summit? I expect that he reach a lot of people because he can achieve billions of people and I'm very happy that he support the Austrian summit because it's very necessary and it's great that he do that. Paul, you've been, uh, you've had a love affair with food for most of your life. What is your advice to young people who want to be a vegetarian chef? Pardon? I just it's, wondered it's... about um, what your advice is to young people who want to be a chef. They should be curious and they should discover the biodiversity of our nature and if they have a good passion. So I think that's one of the best jobs you can have. It, Paul, it's fantastic to talk to you. I know you're a very busy man, so I must let you go. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. I was so tempted to say I'll be back, but I didn't. Pet owners in Western Canada and the United States are being urged to take extra care of their pets during the ongoing heat wave. The Cochrane and Area Humane Society in Alberta have decided the best way to get dogs to drink was by leading them to an ice-cold paddling pool. Temperatures there have continued to break records with the latest high of 118 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember yesterday we had bears in the sea trying to cool down. Meanwhile, this dog owner in the city of Edmonton posted on social media um, how she was now making ice cold popsicles to persuade her dog to keep eating and drinking during the record breaking weather. Not cute at all, is he? Absolutely not. Oh, and uh, the, chan the Chancellor's got a new dog. We'll tell you all about him uh, in a short time after the weather.
Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Good morning. So today's weather for the first day of July, the same as the last day of June. Once again, mostly fine and dry. Some showers that could be heavy at times, but not everywhere. But around eastern areas, it's cool and cloudy. And there's a lot of mist and fog around this morning too, burning away quite readily soon. So we will see brighter skies this afternoon. But eastern England, particularly around Lincolnshire, East Anglia, cloudy, cool with some rain, some showers across southern areas. Some of them could be heavy, particularly for Dorset and Hampshire. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.